Hello and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week we're going to be joined by Dr. Sabina Stanley of Johns Hopkins University. We'll talk about her work using computer modeling to study the atmosphere of Saturn. But first, we go about as far back in time as we can get examining conditions during the first millionth of a second after the Big Bang. Next, we learn how oxygen affected ancient forms of life on Earth long ago. Then, we examine a new source of X-rays discovered near the heart of the Milky Way galaxy and hear how long period comets can still produce modern shower, meteor showers in our modern day. In the first millionth of a second after the Big Bang, the newborn cosmos was ever so briefly filled with a strange soup of quarks, which make up protons and neutrons, and gluons, which normally hold them together. By smashing lead ions together at nearly the speed of light, researchers at CERN managed to recreate this quark-gluon soup. They found this plasma resembled water more than it did a gas, making the term quark-gluon soup even more apropos than ever before to our understanding of the early cosmos. A new study from Georgia Tech examines the effects of rising oxygen levels on Earth billions of years in the past by looking at snowflake yeast. The study found that small organisms which once dominated our planet stayed small in nearly oxygen-free environments. It was not until higher concentrations of oxygen filled the atmosphere that organisms were able to grow to larger sizes. This study helps us better understand why life forms remained extremely small until a time when the Earth held on to a significant amount of atmospheric oxygen. Viewing the Downtown Milky Way in X-rays. Astronomers discovered an unknown jet of energy radiating from our supermassive black hole. Astronomers at the University of Massachusetts Amherst believe that this feature could possibly be the result of a magnetic reconnection event similar to those that can cause solar flares on the sun. Meteor showers are capable of producing magnificent displays of shooting stars. Most of these annual displays are the result of Earth passing through trails of debris left behind by passing comets. A new study from the SETI Institute finds that even long period comets, having orbital periods of up to 4,000 years long, can still cause shooting stars in the night sky for thousands of years after they pass Earth. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time, and the oldest light in the universe hold secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we're going to talk with Dr. Sabina Stanley of Johns Hopkins University about her work helping us to better understand everyone's favorite ringed planet, 
Saturn. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Professor Sabina Stanley. She is a planetary physicist at Johns Hopkins University, and she's recently done some fascinating work uncovering the secrets of the atmosphere of Saturn. Welcome to the show, Sabina. Thanks so much. I'm happy to be here. Nice. So just start us off gently here. What uh, what made you want to study Saturn in the first place? What makes it so interesting? Well, the great thing about Saturn is, you know, not only is it visually spectacular, um, but it's also got some really interesting mysteries surrounding its magnetic field. So planets, a lot of the planets in our solar system have magnetic fields that are generated in their deep interiors by something we call dynamo action. And Saturn uh, is one of those planets that does this, but it does it in a very unique way for our solar system. The magnetic field that Saturn produces is perfectly symmetrical with respect to the rotation axis. So if I were to somehow be able to float at a single latitude and go all the way around the planet, I would see exactly the same magnetic field the whole way around. And that's just not seen at any other planet in our solar system. That's so cool. So how, how off is Earth's magnetic field compared to Saturn? Great. Right. So Earth's magnetic field, if you think about the biggest component of Earth's magnetic field, that we usually call that the dipole field. That's where you think of there's like a magnetic north and a magnetic south. Field lines go out of one hemisphere, go into the other. That axis of the dipole is tilted about 10 degrees from Earth's rotation axis. Hmm. That's fascinating. So what were you able to find out in your study about Saturn and what causes it? Right. So we were really interested to try and see whether or not we could produce a magnetic field with big computer simulations. So we run computer simulations of the dynamo process. These models are kind of kind of similar to what you would see used in climate models, for example. It, we solve for all the fluid motions going on inside the planet based on what the forces are acting on the uh, fluid. But we also have to consider the fact that the fluid's a good electrical conductor and so magnetic fields get generated. So we also have to solve for the magnetic field. So we use our models and we um, generate magnetic fields, but we can kind of put in different ingredients, let's say into the model um, in an effort to try and uh, mimic Saturn. And then we can see whether those ingredients actually produce the field we see at Saturn. So for our models, and all this work was really led by a grad student of mine who just graduated uh, with her PhD, Chi Yan. Um, Congrats to her. Yes, absolutely. So what she did was uh, we decided to see whether the suspected helium rain layer that exists a little bit in, deeper in Saturn near, um, near the bottom of the atmosphere, kind of where um, the interior starts getting to high enough pressures that the hydrogen and helium in the external atmosphere layer starts doing weird things. Uh, we wanted to see what the effects of that helium uh, rain layer was going to have on the dynamo, which was generated beneath that. So what we found was that um, we needed a helium rain layer that was quite thick in Saturn, uh, surrounding the dynamo region, and it needed to have a very specific temperature pattern on the outer boundary of it in order to drive what are called thermal winds. These are basically strong zonal jets that occur inside the helium rain layer. And all of this acted to um, take the magnetic field that was being generated deeper down and kind of filter out anything that wasn't perfectly symmetrical with respect to the rotation axis. And that ends up producing this nice symmetric field we see outside of the planet. Wow, that's fascinating. So it sounds like the models you're using, um, <clears throat> if they were designed, uh, at least in part, to model climate on Earth, it seems like this was far different. What were some of the challenges you faced? Trying to right, so, yeah, so, so it's not exactly a climate model. It's just that it solves the same sorts of equations. But the big difference when you're modeling the dynamo regions, the deep interiors of planets to understand how their magnetic fields are generated, um, you have 
usually a very, very thick layer, right? Our atmosphere, it's very wonderful for us and, and when we study it, but it's a very thin layer of the planet. Instead, you're, you're modeling a very thick layer. Um, you're modeling all the electromagnetism processes that are going on in that layer as well. Um, and then you're trying to understand what the interactions of that layer is with everything surrounding it, like the helium rain layer. Now, the key thing for us is that this layer of helium rain that's surrounding the dynamo, it makes that layer stable to motion. So, so fluid parcels in the deep interior of a planet are hot and they're trying to rise buoyantly. And that's how planets remove heat. But when they get to the bottom of this helium rain out layer, um, there's sort of a, there's a density gradient there that doesn't let the fluid parcels rise anymore. So they kind of get stuck. So oh. you can only really create motions in the lateral directions, kind of like in the direction of latitude and longitude, as opposed to the, the outward direction. Um, and that's really what kind of stops magnetic fields from generating outside of that layer. And it also ends up creating this very axisymmetric field. So, um... A lot of the data you used came from the Cassini spacecraft, uh, especially during its final plunge into Saturn. Can you tell us uh, what Cassini brought to this study and what you're able to learn from it? Yes, well, Cassini, the Cassini mission was this marvelous mission that went to Saturn and it studied Saturn for over a decade. Uh, most of that study, it didn't only just study Saturn, it set, studied um, Saturn's rings and the entire moon system of Saturn. That, Saturn's got so many really cool moons as well. Uh, but to do most of that work, it orbited Saturn in the equatorial plane. So it kind of went around near the equator and out to visit the moons because all the moons are in the equatorial plane. But near the end of the mission, uh, the Cassini team decided to change the orbit and make it a more polar orbit, which means it kind of came in near the North Pole, got really close to the planet and then went out again. Um, and it did that so it could dive between the rings, which was kind of cool. It was a, yeah. the, it's a great um, data about stuff like the rings mass and stuff like that. But it also got it closest to the planet than we'd have, that we'd ever been before with a, a mission to study the magnetic field. And so we got some really good magnetic data near the end of the mission because of the Cassini team. And the interesting, for us, what was really interesting about this data is it really got the small scale features of the field. Um, so not only are we, can we say something about what the dipole is like, we can talk about sort of things on smaller length scales, things we call the quadrupole and the octopole and the, whatever the fourth pole is called and stuff like that. So uh, there's, there's all sorts of small scale structure. And so in our models, because of this new data, so the one new data, that kind of gives you really close insights into, into a field like a magnetic field of a planet is fantastic. But it also means that when we try and simulate it and understand the processes that create that field, we kind of have a lot more things we need to match now. So that was another crucial thing about this paper is that not only were we trying to make a really symmetric field, we were trying to create a field that matched um, all the small scale structure in the field that we see as well. And that's why we had to do things like tune that temperature pattern on the outer boundary of the um, helium rain layer and stuff like that. That's really what allowed us to match all the structure we see in the field. Hmm. And um, you're also able to shed some light on uh, the length of the day on Saturn. Why is that, so so, <laughs> why is that so difficult to measure and how to get around it? Yeah, so I wish I could say that we shed some light on the length of the day. We <laughs> didn't, <laughs> okay? Um, instead, uh, why it's so, it's actually, so here's how I'll put it. Um, when you have sort of a, a normal, a, a rocky planet, let's say you have a planet like Mars or Mercury who's sur who has a surface, right? The way we tell the length of day of the planet is we kind of stare at one location, maybe it's a crater or a volcano or something, and you wait till it goes all the way around the planet, and then you see when it comes back again. And that tells you how long the day is on that planet. But on the giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, there are no solid surfaces. And so you can't follow a structure. Each of these planets have these gorgeous winds that are going around, but the winds are always, they're different in different locations and in time. So you can't also just fix to like a, a the great red spot on Jupiter, for example, or something like that. So instead you try and look for what's a feature that we think is kind of fixed inside the planet that um, would repeat and have some structure that we could measure to get the length of day. 
And what people have been using for the giant planets is their magnetic fields. Now, the way it works is as long as a planet's magnetic field has a tilt with respect to the rotation axis, then that magnetic field, there are all these um, uh, high energy particles that spiral along the magnetic field lines and they release radio emissions. And we can detect those radio emissions um, sometimes, depends on how strong they are. But um, they will have a period associated with them, which is based on how fast the planet is rotating. So that's what we do to, to calculate Jupiter's rota uh, rotation rate or length of day. Um, and same with Uranus and Neptune. But at Saturn, the magnetic field is perfectly aligned with the rotation axis as mm -hmm. far as we can tell from the data. And so we can't use that method. But what we noticed in our models is that the magnetic field of Saturn in our models isn't perfectly symmetric with respect to the rotation axis. It's symmetric enough that it matches the data, but there's a little bit of stuff that's not symmetric right mm -hmm. in the polar region. Mm -hmm. And so we also kind of have a prediction that um, future missions, if they're looking for uh, where are these non-symmetric or non-perfect features of Saturn, they should look very close to the poles. And then maybe there's a possibility of getting um, the length of day of the planet if you can figure out where these non axisymmetric features are and track them. But that's going to have to wait until future missions. Speaking of which, what are we looking forward to for future missions? And oh, gosh. Yeah, so uh, going to the outer solar system it, it, with planetary missions is hard. And it, it's amazing all the work that's being done, but it's also on very long time scales. There currently isn't a planned mission to Saturn um, anytime in the future, although there are proposals. The next mission that's going sort of to the Saturn system is the Dragonfly mission, which is going to one of Saturn's moons, Titan. Mm. Um, and it's gonna fly a dual quadcopter um, all over Titan's surface, which is just an absolutely amazing uh, mission that's being run out of uh, the Hopkins Applied Physics Lab yeah. uh, here. So, so that's the closest we'll get, but we're not gonna really get magnetic field data from Saturn for that. So we're going to have to see in the meantime, we're going to really look at um, other planets in the solar system that we are getting new magnetic data from. So, for example, the Juno mission is currently at Jupiter, taking all sorts of wonderful right. data on Jupiter's magnetic field. And so we try and also, because Saturn and Jupiter, they're both gas giants, we try and understand them in a comparative sense, right? If, if something's happening in Jupiter, do we expect it to be happening in Saturn? Do we see features of it in both? So right now we're also trying to concentrate on figuring out the similarities and difference between Jupiter's and Saturn's magnetic field. That's fabulous. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Sabina. It's great talking with you. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. And that was uh, Professor Sabina Stanley, planetary physicist at Johns Hopkins University. Make sure to join us next week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion when we're going to be joined by Dr. Bruce Betts. He is Chief Scientist and Light Sail Program Manager for the Planetary Society. We're going to talk about near-Earth objects and how we might protect our planet from potentially hazardous asteroids and comets. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. Subscribers to our VIP newsletter see every episode of this show a day before the general public. Now. We depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, and I hope you did, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or any major podcast provider. 
For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net.